Hi, welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're gonna continue with Go Profiler. In the previous video, part one, we're looking at just a simple word count application implementing an iterative solution. And so if you haven't caught up or you're jumping in at this point, you will want to look at that first part one first, because otherwise so that this video won't make too much sense. What we're doing is profiling some code and we start off with a baseline implementation, which seems pretty straightforward. Um, there are many other ways you can implement this, but this is the implementation I chose. So go look at that video and hopefully it would explain what I did, why I did it. And then um, now you can catch up to this and definitely give me feedback on if you disagree or you have suggestions, I'm always open to feedback. So we did a simple iterative solution and basically it was just, okay, given a set of files for each file, just literally open it using buff IO's scanner to read each line and then give us the word, a line, we split it and we can then comb the words. And we can even use buff IO, the word function and buff IO to even help us. So we don't have to do the splitting and we did that too. And so we, that was our basic implementation. We got it working. We could print out our results. We time it. And so we know exactly how long it takes to process our 15 input files. Now, what we're going to do in part two is profile that implementation. Why profile it? Because we want to see where it's slow. It's taking three seconds and maybe that's the best it can do, but what if it's not? So let's profile it in this part two, and then we're going to make changes according to what we see coming out of our profile result. So Visual Studio Code Editor, here I am in the Go Run go on the run directory and we're looking at profiling and the word count example. So on the examples, I have the examples we'll be working on already. So part one was exercise one. So in part two, we'll just copy this piece of code. The reason why I am sort of taking stuff out of the example directory and pasting it into this main.go is so we don't have to go into those directory and mock with the code. So let's see what has changed to enable profiling. Well, before I do that, let me show you the documentation for Go Profiler. If you go to golang.org forward slash packages and you just search for pprof and scroll down, you'll see first you'll land on pprof under the net package. And this serves the profiling data over HTTP, but we're not interested in that. We want to go to the runtime package and under there there's pprof and you click on that it'll take you to this part and it tells you how to run P, um, profiler and essentially if you look you can see that if you do go test or even if you have an application you just pass in an option that says cpu profile and the file to write the output the cpu profile information and for memory profiling same thing and if you're doing testing well you could also do benchmark but in terms of instrumenting your code for profiling, basically this is all you have to add. You use the flag package to add a flag parameter. And as you can see, this matches up with what you passed call in here. So you can choose something simple. If you don't like CPU profile, you can just go with CPU. But I would advise that you stick with this very rather long name because it's unlikely to collide with anything else any other option you might later add to your application. And that's just my thoughts on it. Um, whether you leave this in production code or not, that's going to be up to you, but hurt anything because as you can see, it sort of becomes dead code if profiling is not turned on. But anyway, this is the rest of your application. So write your code first. And that's why I did part one first by writing, focusing on getting a solution going. And then in part two, I'll literally just do this. I'll have these two variables and this piece of code before I start doing anything and this piece of code after I finish doing all my work. And that's it. The way you examine the result is by running this command go tool. And so go tool is just the tool command allow you to pass another application that you want go to run. So that's all that's happening there. You're really running the pprof command that comes with go. Let's look at our code. So if you look here, you'll see we have our command line option defined and and then the rest of our application remains unchanged except for this line but essentially now i'm using lengths of flags that are 
That's because since we have um, arguments that we're passing to our application, we really don't want to check os.arg because that's going to be misleading because some of those could be flags. So what we want to do is check flags of our args to see if it's after processing flags, if there's anything else. If there is nothing else left, that means that oh, we didn't get any files for to process. That's the one change. And then since I'm doing that, when it comes to actually picking up the file names that I need to process, well, again, I cannot use os.args because I have to account for the flags and I don't know where they are and so on. So it's best to use flags.args to give me the list of extra things that it did not process. And so for all of those, I turned that into a slice and I range over it. I didn't have to turn it into a slice, honestly. Uh, it just simply doing this alone <laughs> would work. Um, so um, I don't know why I did that. It's because I think, oh, because I had some, the older code, uh, OS that arg was a slice. And so when I substituted that, I kept it. But yeah. All right. So that's about it. Like I said, nothing much. Everything else is from the documentation. And so now let's run this code CO to profile it. So for us, we're going to build it. Oh, okay. And so I'm already in my directory here and I've updated the code already. So let's do go build. And then if I try to run it, no input files. If I do minus H for help, for example, I want to use in flags um, package. It automatically gives you sort of the minus H for help anyway, even if you don't add it. So let's do CPU profile. And let's call it, put it in a file called cpu.prof, mem profile, and put it in a file called mem.prof. And our input is going to be from our data directory, our test data rather, and Sherlock home file. We can process profile just one file. And we run it like this. And so we can see, if I do plus minus lh, we can see that um, for my CPU file, I have some data. For my mem file, I have some data. Now, if you look at the Golang documentation for how to run the profiler on your output file, it says to go tools, pprof, and then just specify, you know, like mem, for example. And here you can type helpful commands. So one of the easiest things you can do is just type top to see the top um, metrics. And so this shows us, if, since we're looking at memory profile, this look shows us how memory was used, which part of our program was consuming the most memory. I'm not too interested in what memory usage right now. I'm more interested in how fast I can make this thing and not how much memory it's using. Once memory becomes an issue, then I'll profile it and look at the memory usage. So let's get out of here. And instead, I want to look at CPU metrics. And so again, I do top. And so you can see in terms of CPU, where we spend most of our time, um, you can see that we look like we were doing, um, so we got, well, system call, we can't really worry about that. Um, but decode runes, scanning, um, of course, text call, buff IO. So you can see this in reverse order, sort of, like you can see we were scanning word, we used the word scanner function. So you spend some time there, but um, we, also spend some time in text and scanning. Okay, so it's look like the text processing, but I find that this is sort of misleading when you look at it this way. So instead, if you type help and just scroll up a little bit, you see that you have different output options and one of them is PNG. And so if we type PNG, this generates a PNG image of the result. And so this is much more complete. And let's see, let's exit. And so I'll do open profile at PNG. And let's zoom in a bit. And notice you can see already that I have a lot more information than we saw before. And so let's zoom in. Ah, maybe zoom out a little bit. And so scroll up. And so I think this is a much better way of looking at information. You can see type CPU. And this is the go runtime. Of course, most of the time it's going to be spent there. We notice our processing one file took about 300 or 400 milliseconds. So, yep. And this we call main function in the main package. And that is basically pretty much all the time. But then you see these two red arrows and you can see pretty much 50 50 split between printing the result and actually processing the file. 
we're not so much worried about printing the result because we're really concerned with the time that we measure is really how much time we spend processing the file. Remember, we process the file and then we stop counting. Um, we measure that time and then we just print it. So I don't really care how long it takes to print. It takes however long it needs. We can choose not to print, so that is no consequence to us. And so here you can see most of the time we spend in processing file, which makes sense because our main function just literally picks up a file call process this file and do that in a loop. That's our iterate solution. Process file calls buff.io to do scan the words. And of course we scan in text, right? So we do is buff.io, can you scan something? And if yes, you can scan something, then get the text. But that did not take as much time. The actual scanning, when you call buff.io, when you call scanner.scan, that's where the actual work is done. And then it returns a Boolean letting you know if it could possibly scan. That, as you can see, spent most of its time actually reading from the underlying, underlying file, which makes sense, instead of actually turning that result into, you know, words or doing the Unicode stuff. So we sort of saw this show up when we did top, but the real problem, the hot path, H-O-T, hot path, was really reading from the file. So if we look at this, most of the time was spent in process file, and process file doing scanning and actually reading from the file. And you can see this is the low level call, the OS syscall. So this is where we saw the syscall, right? So it's, when I say it was misleading is because it picked up this syscall. And so you can see if you sort of went back, it told you that our syscall was dominating, but to understand why you sort of have to go back up this path. And um, well, we can see it now much more clearly than when we looked at it, um, but just by looking at top. So I find this to be a much better picture of what's going on. So now we can say, well, okay, we spend most of our time sort of just trying to read from the file. What we can do in our next application to speed things up is to see if we can read files in parallel. Now, this was just one file. So let's see if this still holds up because one of the things that happen when you profile just like a single input or a small set of input compared to a larger data set you get different results. So let's rerun our application now with all the data. And let's still see if, let's see, let's see if we still see the hot path the same way. Uh, so I'll do this. And instead of going starting pprof and then typing PNG, I can actually type minus PNG as an option. Ah, let me see, exit. It ignored it there, so let's put it here, minus PNG, and it will write the file output, so I don't have to go into the program. So let's do open 002, come on, 002. And so let's expand this again, zoom in, and things look a little bit different, um, but you know, now we're taking three seconds, as we know, about three and a half seconds, still, the hot path is still in file processing, makes sense. And again, scanning, reading from the underlying file. And so, yep, still reading file. So we can tell from this that if we can sort of parallelize our reading, so in the next version, if we make concurrent reading files concurrent and we have mul multiple CPUs, if you don't have multiple CPUs, it wouldn't matter. You simply just have to read one file at a time. And if you have single platter, then it really doesn't matter how many readers you create, even if you have multiple CPU, because your platter could only be reading from one place. So um, hard drive is going to essentially um, be a problem for you. But at least we can, in my case, I know I have solid state drive and I have multiple processors, so or cores. So I will try as my first thing to read files in parallel and then see where's my next bottleneck. So that is going to be in part three. So that's it. See you in the next video.